Turn with me to Romans the 11th chapter. We're way more than halfway through the book of Romans and what an adventure Romans has been. Um, the last couple of chapters have been dealing with the dealing with the Gentiles and the, and, and the Hebrews, the Jews. You ever wonder why the world hates the Jews so much? I mean, we know why the Arabs hate the Jews because they're one got the inheritance and the other one didn't. Uh, we know why there's there's a family squabble there, but that doesn't account for all the hatred everywhere else in the world. Um, you realize back in the early 1930s, millions and millions of Jews were being literally exterminated. A lot of that was the fact that there were there were people, <laughs> Nazis if you will, and I'll say his name Hitler, and others who were the true white supremacists. Okay? <laughs> you want to know what a white supremacist looked like, that's what they looked like. And, uh, and they, they were supposedly Christian. At least they used that moniker. And their biggest thing against the Jews are supposedly was the fact that they killed Jesus. And their hatred for the Jews was based upon that. Actually, it was a lot of other things. But that was what they used. As if somehow, that since God rejected the Jews, which actually that wasn't the case, the Jews rejected Jesus. Since they were rejected, all of a sudden the Gentiles were the number one dog in the hunt. <laughs> Paul was addressing things like this. He wanted to make sure that everyone would understand that it was not the Jews who were rejected, but it was the Jews who rejected Christ. It wasn't that, there, that the Gentiles were out searching for Jesus. They weren't. They weren't searching for even, they weren't even searching for God. But God found them. And by his grace and mercy, the Gentiles were the ones who were bestowed the honor of spreading the gospel of Jesus. And that is it in a nutshell. That's what he's talking about this morning. And so keep that in mind as we go through these verses this morning because this is on the forefront of what he's talking about. So let's look in verses 11, starting in verse 11, what I call stumble but not falling. You know, there is a difference between stumbling and falling, right? I don't know if you admit it or not, but you stumble all the time, don't you? <laughs> and the stumbling is not the problem, is it? I, I mean, I stumble all the time, but I, I catch myself, rock myself, and we're good. It's the falling. And actually, it's not even the falling. It's the sudden stop that gets you. <laughs> and so you find yourself stumbling. And you catch yourself, you right yourself. We all do that. And we do it every day in our life. Metaphorically, we all do it spiritually too. <clears throat> we stumble. But we're not falling. Help, I'm falling and I can't get up. <laughs> Y'all remember the commercial, right? You used to irritate me to death. <clears throat> now, so, we, well, we, so, you, just because you stumble, doesn't mean that you've fallen. So we remember that as we read, read this verse. I am saying then that they did not stumble to that they might fall. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the Jewish people. Let it not be. Let it not be. But by their false step, the rejection of Christ, salvation is to the nations to make them jealous. In verse 12, 
And if their false step is riches of the world, and their failure is riches, how much more is the fullness of them, which he's talking about the Gentiles. Every man can repent and turn to Christ and be restored to God. That is going to be the ultimate message of this passage. You see, last week we talked about the callousness of the Jewish heart as a nation. There is to be a restoration of the nation of Israel. Spiritually. Many in Israel are going to return to God and they're going to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. It's not happening now much, but one day it will. So has Israel stumbled, and this is the central question, has Israel stumbled so that it may fall? The contrast between stumbling and fall is devastating. The idea is that of a permanent and final fall spiritually. It's not whether, well, I fell, I'm getting myself. It's talking the difference between stumbling and falling and actually falling to never rise again. That's the, that's the contrast that Paul is bringing uh, to this passage. So is the Israel's problem permanent, uh, with Christ permanent? Is it final? Will Israel never accept God's Son, Jesus Christ, as the true Messiah? Is the spiritual fall of Israel to be forever? Paul says, let it not be. That's a strong term, what we call in Greek imperative. In other words, it's almost a command. Let it not be. No. Not no. But really no. Okay? <laughs> so, absolutely not. You see, God has opened the door of salvation to the entire world. It was through the Jews by their acceptance of Christ that the world was going to know that Jesus was their Savior. But the Jews rejected Him as Savior. The Lord's messengers were first sent to Israel first. But Israel did not want to hear that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God Himself. Very few actually received the Gospel. In fact, so many rejected the message that it can be said that Israel, the nation as a whole, has stumbled, we talked about this last week, stumbled over Christ. So God sent His messengers throughout the entire world, the Gentile world, in search of any person who had received this message of His Son. God, the, the Gentiles, God did what the Jews had always failed to do. God threw open the door of salvation to the entire world because the Jews rejected Him. I want you to think how wonderful it would have been if the Jews had actually embraced Jesus Christ. And they became God's missionary force to receive the message, to carry the message of the gospel to the entire world. It could have been different. Think how wonderful it would be since we have that responsibility now if, we, if, if everyone would receive Christ. Think how wonderful it would be if we dedicate our lives more sacrificially to God, carry God's message of salvation to the world, how many more people would be saved and delivered from death? The phrase, God worked all things out for good. He took Israel's rejection of Christ and enriched the world. Why? Why? Because God has determined that His Son, Jesus Christ, shall have as many brothers who will worship and serve Him throughout eternity. Therefore, if a person, a people reject the message of God, God will work it out to send the message to someone else. His work and His will will not be stopped. How many blessings 
are being missed today. Because we're not sending that message out. We're not witnessing to that person that God put in our life. If God, if God wants that person to hear the gospel, guess what? He'll hear the gospel. I, if He's calling on me to do it, guess what? I need to do it. I, the blessings of doing that would be astonishing. Notice that He says, God stirred the Jews to be restored. God stirred the Jews to be restored. <clears throat> God has not forsaken the Jews. The door to salvation is just as wide open for them as it is for the Gentiles, for us. The Jews can look at true Christian believers and, and the, we're a witness to the Jews about Jesus. Yeah, the Jews can look at the true Christians and they can see the holiness, the love, and the joy, and the peace in our lives. And the, and the Jews can be stirred to receive Christ. In fact, this is the very point of the passage. God sees to it that some Jews are provoked. That is stirred to receive Christ in the glorious life of salvation which He offers. Now, I've said it before, but I can't stand happy people. You know why? You know why? Because you know, I want to know why. I, why are you so happy? When everything's falling apart, why are you so happy? And it irritates me. Makes me want to know more about that person. Why they're so happy. Wouldn't it be great if we showed all the qualities of God in our lives and then we can say, that's from God. And the Jews missed all of that. The Jews were, the, uh, the Jews were just thinking about doing their own thing, about keeping the law and being rigorous, rigorous and, and, uh, and, and keeping the law. And they just, they have no happiness and blindly and religiously following the law. There was no joy. There was no peace. And there was always that concern that what if I break one of them? <clears throat> so there was no happiness. On the other end, the Gentiles who received Christ, what did they do? I know Jesus. Here, let me help you with that. Let me give you this. Let, let me show you God's love. It's totally opposite of the way the Jews were. There was a difference between daylight and dark. May I ask you a question today? Can we see that difference in saved people and lost people today? If we want people to be provoked to come to know Jesus, in this particular case, it was Jews, but it, it goes for anybody. We want to show them Christ in our lives, so we need to provoke people by our works, by our actions, and by our love to show Christ lives within us. If you want to find, if you want to find God, you need to know Jesus. You need to accept Him as your Savior. We should not forget that in many instances the gospel only went out to the Gentiles after the Jewish people rejected it. In this sense, the rejection of the gospel by the Jews was riches to the Gentiles. Oh, you're lost, my game. It was, and literally, you know, they had the first shot at it. They rejected it, and so now the, the Gentiles are the ones who are being blessed and enriched by, by God. It wasn't the Jewish reject Jewish people, the Jewish rejection of Jesus and Messiah caused the Gentiles to be saved. It just merely gave more opportunity for the gospel to be go to the Gentiles. And many Gentiles took advantage of, of the opportunity. Y'all do know what I mean by saying Gentiles. Any, the Gentiles are just anyone that's not a Jew. <laughs> that's us. So, Though we have an as Gentiles, we have an opportunity. We are given a responsibility. 
In verses 13 through 15, let's look at that. But I am speaking to you all Gentiles. Uh oh, that means he's talking to us. For as much as indeed then I am an apostle of nations, I am making my ministry great. And if in any way I might provoke to indignation my own flesh and might say, Son of them, if in any way I might provoke to indignation my own flesh and might say some of them, and that's the same verse. <laughs> For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what is the acceptance <clears throat> if not of life out of death? Paul was God's primary, primary minister to the Gentiles in the first century. He was the one who he wrote, we the book of Acts is a the latter part of Acts is a is a journey, you know, tells about his journeys. Uh, Paul magnified his ministry. What does it mean by magnified? Enlarged. It was the Jews. He went to the Jews first, but he says, I my ministry was enlarged. It wasn't that he was getting any more money. It wasn't that he was getting any more popular. It wasn't that you know, he had so many people coming to his tent services. It wasn't that. It was the fact that he had enlarged his ministry that he would be able to preach and teach to anyone and everyone. The opportunity was enlarged, magnified. He stressed the fact every chance that he could, that he magnified glorified his ministry. He had two purposes. He wanted to arouse the Jews to jealousy, to envy. That is, he wanted them to stir them to look at Christ. He wanted them to look and see what he was doing for the Gentiles. He says, I know you're rejecting, but rejecting, but look what he's doing here. This could be yours. Paul wanted to hasten the day for Israel's restoration. He knew there was to be a restoration, therefore he knew that every time he was able <coughs> to reach a Jew for Christ, the callous on Israel's heart would soften a little more. It wasn't that he hated his own kind. He loved his own kind. He wanted them to know Christ. And he did it by going to the Gentiles and winning the Gentiles and saying, here's what God can do for you if you'll just believe. In the same way, shouldn't that be our feelings for our families? Uh-oh. I'm, I'm, I'm messing that up. I have a feeling, just a feeling, just a shot in the dark that every one of us and our families have people that you know is lost. Are they either turned a little far away from God? How we deal with those people, how we exhibit ourselves, how we show, how are we showing Christ to those people? Or are we? I can, I can just tell you this. If you get mad at one of your family members and cuss them out, you're not showing Christ. That's a simple fact. The idea here that Paul is trying to say, I, I want to show these people what God can do for them. Because I love them so much. You wonder... Why preachers harp on, why the Bible harps on living a good life. It harps on loving one another. Loving your enemies instead of hating them. You wonder why? It's not because it's just the right thing to do. It's because it actually could help somebody come to see Christ. That's what this is all about. It's not whether or not we're going to please God or not. He knows we're, we're lost and that we're sinners. He knows we're going to stumble. He, know, he just knows that. But the fact is, He wants to put on the very best face for the lost of this world. And He wants us to show His love through us. 
And that's the opportunity we have as ambassadors for Christ. So if the rejection, that is, the rejection of Israel, led to the reconciliation of the world to God, what shall the receiving, the restoration of them be, but life from the dead? Now reconciliation of the world has a two-fold meaning. It means that all men, both Jew and Gentiles, can be reconciled, reconciled to God. Not only can Gentiles be reconciled to God or made right, but the Jews can still be that way. And it also means that all men can now have peace with God and possess the peace of God and that all men, both Jew and Gentile, can be reconciled to each other. <clears throat> How can that be? Do you realize in the first century <clears throat> there were churches that were filled with mixed with Jewish believers and Gentile believers? That, that's, a, that's a big thing for the Jews to worship with a Gentile. You, you know what they call Gentiles, don't you? Dogs. I mean, they can come consider Gentiles humans. We can be reconciled to each other because of one thing. Because we know Jesus Christ as our Savior. Jew and Gentile, black and white, rich, poor, doesn't matter. The common factor of Jesus Christ dwelling within us overwhelms all other obstacles. Paul's saying we can, we can be reconciled with God. We can be reconciled with each other because of this. Paul believed strongly in the restoration of Israel. And the very fact that he asked the question indicates his belief. He firmly expected Israel to be restored moving from life to death. I'm sorry. Life from the dead. You remember that picture in Ezekiel? The dry bones? That was a picture of Israel. Dead. Dry. There was no hope for any life. And what did he see? Came back to life. Stumbled. Seemed to be dead. They didn't fall. There will be a restoration of Israel. We won't see it as saved believers. We won't see it because we'll be with Christ. But we won't see it from this earth. But there will be a day when the hearts of the Israelites, the Jewish people, will be opened. And they'll have the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. And then there will be enough to where Israel will be, and the nation of Israel will be restored. You know, the restoration of Israel will be a most glorious event, an event so glorious that it will take a true, it will be like a true resurrection. It will lead to a new world, a world of righteousness that will benefit all the people involved. God's going to keep His promise to Israel. To Abraham. He's going to keep His promise. And he will set himself up as king of Israel. It won't be David. It won't be Saul. It won't be Solomon. But Jesus Christ will sit upon the throne. And he will rule and reign. And you know who will be helping him? Oh, we will. In verse 16. And if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also. And if the root is holy, the branches are also. The, the Jews always dedicated the first fruit of his, his harvest to God. He gave the first part to God. And by giving the first part, the man was saying to God that he was dedicating all his food to God. And it's not necessary to offer every mouth full to God. The offering was the first part sanctified the whole. In other words, <clears throat> he would take his food and he'd take it, he would offer and sacrifice the part, the first part. 
and it would be considered holy. Well, the rest of it, which wasn't eaten, it wasn't same time, it was considered holy as well. That don't mean a whole lot to us today. I mean, you know, we, we don't think about it. But to the Jews back then, they understood that completely and thoroughly. And then it says the lump is so if the first fruit is holy, then the lump is also. A lump is something mixed in together, it's a lump of something. Um, the rest of it, Jews mixed in together, Jews and Gentiles. That's what he's talking about. And so what he's saying is, if that first bite is holy, then the rest of it, what it came from, is holy too. And the, the second picture in that passage is, is that of a little tree planted by the uh, planted uh, and the sapling, that little tree, the sapling is offered to God. Plant a little tree and you say, and you, and you, and you say this, I'm dedicating this tree to God. And it starts to get bigger. And it starts to get bigger. And it grows out more branches. Well, Technically, the only part we gave to God was that original part, that little that little base there and all these other stuff we didn't do. And he's saying, no, it's all the same tree. It's all the same tree. Now, we'll, we'll come back to this next week because we'll be talking about some branches. <laughs> we'll be talking about some things like that. But the point is this. If the first fruit is whole, it's not necessary, or the, if, if the sapling is is offered to God. Every branch thereafter is looked upon as being sacred to God. It's not necessary to dedicate each branch separately. So if the first fruit is holy, the first fruit probably represents the first Christians who were Jewish. Their conversion was something holy and good for the church. After all, each of the apostles and most of the human authors of the Scriptures were Jewish. And if the conversion of this first fruit was good for the Gentiles... How much better will it be when the harvest, complete harvest is brought in? What does this mean for us? I, I, I feel like I'm giving you some facts, but I'm not really giving you anything that you can chew on yet. But I want you to think about something. What we find here in this passage is the fact that every man, Jew or Gentile or whatever division you want to have in life, every person can repent and they can turn to God. It doesn't matter if your heart's been hardened. It doesn't matter if you've lived your life in complete sin and rail your life and you're a complete heathen. It doesn't matter if you don't even believe in God. What matters is, is the fact that you at this moment can turn and repent to God and all of that can change in a heartbeat. That's what matters. Another thing that we can get from this is the fact that we've been given a great opportunity to spread the gospel. The Jews stumbled. And God went to the Gentiles to be his, us, to be His ambassadors to the world. It's a great responsibility. It's a responsibility that we should all take very, very seriously. And it's more than just spreading the words. But it's living our lives. And we are to spread the word, the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone. Even the ones whose hearts have been hardened to God. A saved Christian Jew is no more spiritual or holy than a Gentile Christian. Can't, you, you, you see that, don't you? That's what this is going to talk about, and we're going to talk about that more next week. Your preacher here is no more holier than you are. Okay? I, I know that some, I, I know that my wife worships me, and she's not in here, so I can say it. <laughs> but I, I'm just a poor human being, stumbling as everyone else. I have just guaranteed that it shall get told. <laughs> you don't worship people. You don't do stuff like that. You don't think that I'm a better Christian than you are. And you don't think someone else is a better Christian than you are. We're all holy. 
The Jews, a Christian Jew is just as holy as we are and we are just as holy as they are. We're all God's children. It takes away the, it takes away the barriers between, well, any kind of people. Now Paul is specifically dealing with Jews and Gentiles, but man, this principle last goes through anything. We've all met people who think they're more holier than thou. Maybe you have been holier than thou some people. But the bottom line is this. The only thing that connects us all together is the gift of Jesus Christ and His salvation. And that puts us all on an even plane. We've all got our jobs to do to spread the gospel of Christ. And I will say this. Some are doing a better job of it than others. But the job's the same. Maybe it takes different forms. Some have to stand behind the pulpit and others just reach out to their neighbors and or their friends or their family and just talk to them. All saved people are God's children. Yes, there were problems between the Jews and the Gentiles. There was talking back and forth about who truly was God's people. And Paul's answer is plain. We are all God's people. He loves us just as much. There's none that's holier than that. And so this morning, we're going to end by doing one thing, what we're supposed to do. I'm going to describe to you what it means to come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Because I'd be neglecting my job if I did it. Jesus Christ came into this world. For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son. Why? So that He could live a perfect life. Fulfill the law. The one that dooms every one of us. So that we have the opportunity of salvation. And so what we need to do this morning is if you're hearing this message and the Spirit of God is talking to your heart saying, yes, I'm a lost sinner. I've never come to, I've never, I've never come to the point of, of asking Christ into my life and trusting in Him. If you've never done that, God is going to be leading you to that path. He's going to want you to recognize that Jesus Christ came and died for you. That He died, was buried, rose again on the third day, and at this moment is sitting on the right hand of the Father waiting for that moment to come back and get us. Until then, you have an opportunity, a choice, to either reject, to stumble over Christ, or to embrace Him. And the question is this, are you stumbling over it? Because you're not going to fall. There will be another opportunity. Well, I say that. Maybe not. I know you have this opportunity. But I know that simply because you stumble, you haven't failed. And given the opportunity, He'll call you again. And you'll have another opportunity. Or you can accept it today. Tell him yes. Quit stumbling over Christ and accept Him. And accept the responsibilities and the blessings of being a child of God. This is up to you today. And I hope and pray that you'll make the right decision. So as we stand and we prepare for an invitation, I don't know your heart. Don't know your life. I don't know, I don't know, you know what's going on with you. But I'll tell you, this is maybe your only opportunity. Life is short. We never know when and how much shorter it's going to be. And God may be calling you today to come to Him for your salvation. To accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. To hear it and to accept and not reject. So don't do that today. So as we sing this morning, the Spirit is leading you for salvation. Maybe your sin, maybe your life is full of filled with sin. Would you come and make it right with Him? Get reconciled with God.